good morning students we will be starting with the module 4 today so before exactly starting the module 4 let us discuss a little bit about noise we have been discussing about noise in general till now let me briefly discuss the types of noise which are going to affect our communication system you are going to study more about noise in much larger detail in other courses mostly in analog communications course you are going to study more about noise but here i'm going to discuss only with context to information theory very briefly so you are seeing the slide now in the slide you can see noise can be of two types namely external noise and internal noise external noise is induced into the signal or it is superimposed onto the signal in the channel and internal noise is basically electronic noise which is part of all our electronic circuitry which are helping us in having a communication so in the channel or the external noise can be classified into three categories namely atmospheric noise galactic noise and industrial noise atmospheric noise is mainly because of the wind or the sunlight or the rain or such natural factors whereas galaxy itself is going to introduce electromagnetic noises universe itself is having noise of its own that is called galactic noise industrial noise refers to the noises that are produced by the industries many times these noises can be audible also but these audible noises will have their uh, counterparts in the inaudible range even in the radio frequency range those are industrial noises these are all external noises or the noises which are uh, induced into the channel whereas the internal noises or electronic noises are thermal noise short noise flicker noise burst noise avalanche noise and transit time noise we will not deal with all these noises in detail but especially we will discuss only thermal noise and short noise later on let me go to the next slide where i'll discuss a little more about these noises most of the atmospheric noise is below vhf range vhf means very high frequency range that means uh, from 300 megahertz onwards we call it as uhf range 30 megahertz onwards we call it as vhf range now most of the atmospheric noise is below this vhf range thermal noise is called as agitation noise and also as johnson noise after its discoverer thermal noise is mainly because of the agitation of the charge carriers are the particles inside our devices we have electrons when electrons are agitated at that time thermal noise is produced this is also called as johnson noise because johnson is the one who discovered it short noise is generated by the current flowing across a junction we are using always active devices and whether we use current control devices or voltage control devices whether we use the bjt's or fet's in both the cases we will have junctions in bjt we have junctions which we wanted in uh, fet's we have junctions which we did not want and the junctions got formed out of the process itself so we have all these pn junctions everywhere so short noise is generated by the current flowing across a particular pn junction this noise increases with the decrease in current why when the decrease there is a decrease in current the depletion region will have larger capacitance when there is a larger capacitance that will lead to larger short noise now the power spectral density of the thermal noise and short noise is independent of frequency that is why both of them are coming under something called white noise in the sense the thermal noise and short noise are not frequency dependent they can affect all the frequencies in general right from zero till infinity because thermal noise is because of the agitation 
and short pass is because of the current flowing through a junction and these are not actually frequency dependent especially the power spectral density of these noises is not frequency dependent so they are called as white noise why as white light is affecting all other colored lights in the same way these two noises are affecting all other frequency ranges so these noises are called white noises especially thermal noise and short noise they are called white noise in addition the power spectral density of this thermal noise and short noise they follow the gaussian distribution you are already familiar with the gaussian distribution where from the standard deviation sigma you can go plus 1 and minus 1 left side and right side in the gaussian curve you will have a peak and gradually it will roll down both at the left side and the right side it will roll down and it will come very much nearer to the x axis when it spreads around sigma so that is the gaussian distribution both of these noises follow the gaussian distribution all the other types of noises are non white and they are non gaussian they do not follow the gaussian distribution and they do not affect all the frequency ranges especially the flicker noise it is also called as 1 over f noise because it is predominant when it is nearer to zero that means when the frequency is nearer to zero from dc when the actual transmission starts with ac that is where flicker noise is predominant so due to its reduction with the increase in frequency it is called as 1 over f noise this noise is resulting due to the imperfections in the crystalline structure we are all using devices which are made up of crystalline silicon and because of the imperfections in the crystalline structure uh, there will be a uh, dc range which is affected more so that is called flicker noise it is also called as pink noise as similar power spectral density at visible frequencies would appear pink in color that's why this flicker noise is also called as pink noise the burst noise is characterized by discrete high frequency pulses and hence it is also called as popcorn noise because the noise is similar to the popcorn noise when the corn is popping out from a heated surface the similar noise is produced by this burst noise please understand burst noise is different from burst error we are going to discuss burst error later but that is different burst noise is different so this noise reduces with increase in frequency and its response is inversely proportional to the square of the frequency hence it is further called as 1 over f square noise also avalanche noise occurs in the reverse breakdown mode of the pn junction this type of noise as well as the burst noise occur in the brown region of the power spectral density so in the river actually avalanche or zener effects all are, are happening only in the reverse polarity right so during the reverse breakdown avalanche noise is occurring lastly the transit time noise is occurring when the transit time of the charge carriers approaches the signal period this type of noise occurs in the vhf range also so as far as information theory is concerned we are more interested in thermal noise and short noise all the other noises are of not much importance for us because those two noises are white noises the thermal noise and short noise as they are white noise and in information theory we are not dealing specifically with any frequency range we are more worried about the thermal noise and short noise effects on information okay with this let me end this ppt and let me start my pdf okay let me start chapter 4 or module 4 this module is called as error control coding
whatever I told till now is briefly discussed here also. Let me go through it. Noise is an unpredictable waveform present along with the received signal. The types of noises are as follows, mainly thermal noise and short noise. Thermal noise, also called as Johnson noise, occurs due to the thermal motion and agitation of electrons. Short noise occurs due to the flow of electrons across the semiconductor junctions of the devices. We had already seen these things. Now, both of these noises are called as white noise as their power spectral density is independent of frequency, which means that they affect all signals equally. In addition, both are Gaussian with zero mean and with some variance. When the noise is additive, such channel is called as additive white Gaussian noise. We generally keep on mentioning about AWGN channel. What is the meaning of AWGN channel? Additive white Gaussian noise channel. That means the channel will have white noise. Both thermal noise and short noise are white noise. They will affect all the frequency range. They follow the Gaussian distribution. That means they will always have a sigma standard deviation and around which there will be a slowly uh, rolling off curve at the left side as well as the right side and gradually the curve will come nearer to x axis below. So that is a Gaussian distribution also called as normal distribution. So these noises follow the Gaussian distribution so it is called Gaussian noise and these noises are going to be added to the signal amplitude. There can be multiplicative noises also. Why we are specifically talking about additive noise? Because we are discussing about the noise which is affecting our signal in the channel. So that is why we say additive white Gaussian noise. Whereas in some circuits such as mixers where you have a local oscillator and you have another carrier frequency or a modulating frequency, sorry, modulated frequency and modulating frequency. You will have, you will have information signal, you will have a carrier signal and the carrier signal is generated by the local oscillator. Sometimes we call it as VCO also, voltage control oscillator. In such cases, there is a multiplication happening within the mixer. Now there can be noises which are multiplicative also. So where we consider the noise as additive or where we consider the noise as multiplicative depends on that particular functionality. Here we are considering it as additive because we are dealing more with the channel. We are not dealing with the noises that are generated in the information source. We are dealing with the noise that is occurring in the channel because information theory focuses mostly on this particular aspect of noise. So we will deal with AWGN channel means additive white Gaussian noise channel. We will presume that all our channels are AWGN means noise will be added to the information signal, noise will be white and noise will be Gaussian. Impulse noise occurs as external transient short duration disturbance. This is part of atmospheric noise or part of external noise. Due to lightning or due to switching transients also impulse noise can occur. Let us proceed now. There is a law called Shannon Hartley law because two scientists together frame this particular law. Now this law states that the capacity of a band limited channel with AWGN additive white Gaussian noise is given by this formula. Let me annotate this formula so that you will remember it. So C equals B into LG of 1 plus S by N bits per second. The channel capacity is given by B. B is the bandwidth of the channel in hertz and S is the signal power in watts. N is the noise power in watts. And this is the law framed by Shannon and Hartley together. What does this indicate? 
it indicates that why this LG is there, log to the base 2 is there. Why? Because we are dealing with the binary channel. We are going to transmit only 0 and 1. So naturally LG is there. And we have signal power and noise power. If signal power is much larger than noise power, then naturally this is LG of 1. LG of 1 into B is going to happen there. Now, this is strange. Later on I will discuss this. It may seem strange now, but it is real. I am going to discuss that anyhow later on. What other observations can you do in this particular uh, uh, formula? When B is more, C will be more naturally. Channel capacity is directly proportional to the bandwidth. That means we have different types of channels. Coaxial cable, twisted copper wire, copper wire pair and we have optical fiber. We have free space, even we have extraterrestrial space. Now, each particular channel has a limited bandwidth. Now, we know that optical fiber has a much larger bandwidth when compared to coaxial cable also. Now, if at all we choose such channels for our information transmission, naturally capacity of the channel will be larger. Why? If the bandwidth is larger, then the channel can accommodate different ranges of frequencies. If the channel can accommodate different ranges of frequencies, even the channel capacity will increase. For example, we have highways, we have ring roads. In the ring road, it is basically maybe four lane highway or a six lane highway. Whereas we have bigger state highways and national highways which can be 8 lane highways, 10 lane highways, 12 lane highways. In fact, in the developed countries or even in the Gulf countries, they have highways where each lane is marked for a given speed. So, in such a case, if the width of that road is much larger, let us say 12 lane, 14 lane, 10 lane, in that case, it can handle large capacity of traffic that is obvious same way the communication channels which we use if they have a larger bandwidth then naturally the capacity of the channel is larger but when it comes to this s by n that may seem to be strange to you right now because there is this log function here now let me explain that let us have an exercise now a computer receives data by means of 128 symbols through a telephone channel whose bandwidth is 3.4 kilohertz. This we are familiar. I have already told you that the voice bandwidth is 300 to 3400 hertz. We generally take it as 4 kilohertz. Now here the telephone channel, if its bandwidth is 3.4 kilohertz, telephone channel specifically carries only voice traffic. Now with a signal to noise ratio of 20 decibels. Assuming that the symbols are equiprobable, calculate the maximum symbol rate for the error-free transmission. Now let us solve this exercise. Given is B equal 3.4 kilohertz. Now 10 log of S by N is 20 dB. And S by N is anti-log of 20 by 10, that is 100. Here, signal to noise ratio is given is 20 dB. That is given here. That is why we are actually finding out S by N. Because... If you have to use the Shannon Hartley law, we want S by N in actual ratio, not in decibels. But in this formula, it is given in decibels. That is why we are converting S by N into actual ratio that is 100. I think you got it. We are having 10 log S by N as 20 dB that is given. Now S by N is anti log of 20 by 10 is 100. Now we can substitute this in our uh, Shannon Hartley law. C equals B plus LG of 1 plus S by N. So that is 3.4 kilo into LG of 1 plus 100. So that is what is this? C equals 3400 into LG of 101. That is 22.64 kbps. So when this is 22.64 kilobits per second, look at this B. B is 3.4 kilohertz. C is 22.64 kbps. Why? Because signal to noise ratio is 100. 
when signal to noise ratio is 100 signal is of a much larger power than noise that way we have capacity 22.64 kbps now h is h max it is already given that all symbols are equiprobable there are 128 symbols so h is h max is lg of 128 that is 7 bits per symbol now for error free transmission we must have r less than c the total rate of information transmission must be less than the channel capacity that we had discussed earlier so this is nothing but rs into 7 rs is the symbol rate into 7 bits per symbol that is the maximum entropy that must be less than 22.64 k or rs must be less than 22.64 k divided by 7 or rs must be less than 3.234 kbps that means the information rate from the source cannot exceed 3.234 kilobits per second that is the conclusion let me admit the student okay now after this particular exercise you have understood the application of shannon hartley law now let us proceed this shannon hartley law indicates that the noiseless channel has infinite capacity why that 1 plus s by n if noise is 0 then channel will have infinite capacity it also indicates that for a given channel capacity if the bandwidth is more then snr is less and vice versa for a given channel capacity let us say c is already there if the bandwidth is more then signal to noise ratio has to be less if bandwidth is less then signal to noise ratio has to be more because c equals b plus lg into 1 plus s by n right c equals b into sorry not b plus b into lg of 1 plus s by n right so if c is fixed if the channel capacity is fixed then if b increases s by n has to reduce if b reduces s by n has to increase because they are multiplicative here so the shannon hartley law indicates that the noiseless channel has infinite capacity if n is 0 then c will be infinity it also indicates that for a given channel capacity if the bandwidth is more then snr is less and vice versa now for a given channel the bandwidth is fixed we had discussed the telephone channel for the telephone channel meant only for voice then its bandwidth is 4 kilohertz now the optical fiber will have bandwidth in megahertz and gigahertz whereas telephone channel has bandwidth in kilohertz so that way for a given channel the bandwidth is fixed the coaxial cable comes in between the telephone channel and the optical fiber as we have no control over the noise power because noise is random noise is unpredictable so as we have no control over the noise power one alternative is to increase the channel capacity is to increase the signal power if s is larger then s by n is larger if s by n is larger then c will be larger that is one option but this in turn will increase the power consumption right if at all we have to increase the signal power then it increases the power consumption now the other alternative is to go for channel coding in which the calculated use of redundancy is made use of in accordance with the shannon hartley law c equals b into lg of 1 plus s by n b is fixed now if we want to have more c then we should have more s by n if you want to have more s by n we should have more s then but then we are pumping more power that is one option the next option is the novel invention of shannon himself or shannon hartley together that is channel coding so the other alternative is to go for channel coding in which the calculated use of redundancy is made use of calculated use of redundancy 
means include additional bits along with the information bits and this is a calculated use of redundancy these additional bits are actually calculated or computed based on an algorithm now when you have these additional bits there is no need to increase the signal power because at the receiver it can detect the error which is occurring in a particular position and it can correct that particular error i had shown you as an example in one of the previous classes please recall that here as we are transmitting only binary information our job is easy now again please remember all these are applicable only for the transmission of a binary information even though our carrier is analog in nature the carrier wave is handling binary information only zeros and ones only that way we can add additional bits without actually increasing the carrier's power we can add additional bits and these additional bits are going as additional waveforms when we transmit but these waveforms are calculated which how, how how it has to be zero how it has to be one these are those are specifically calculated that is the calculated use of redundancy so by means of this we are able to increase the channel capacity but that channel coding is not indicated in the shannon hartley law please recall that law c equals b into lg of 1 plus s by n where channel coding is not at all indicated only signal power noise power and bandwidth are indicated that means for the channel coding there is no specific law as such but there are algorithms we are going to see them later on so now the channel encoder systematically adds additional bits to the transmitted message and these additional bits do not carry any information this is important they do not carry any information these are additional bits the channel encoder systematically adds it is systematically adding not randomly adding there is an algorithm adds additional bits to the transmitted message and these additional bits do not carry any information but these are useful for the channel decoder these are useful for the channel decoder to detect and correct errors thus lowering the overall probability of error lowering the error without increasing the signal power we are able to achieve the reduction in error that is the beauty of digital communication so let me proceed further thus when the source encoder removes the redundancy from the source output the channel encoder adds an amount of redundancy this i have been telling you earlier also source encoder is removing the redundancy there we were more interested in reducing the redundancy or reducing the repetition and making the bits compact that was the purpose when we discussed with the source encoding but in the channel encoder it is going to add an amount of redundancy because we are adding additional bits which are not part of information bits these are not carrying any information at all so this is to lower the overall error probability just look at this diagram let me zoom in okay example of error control coding now we have a information rate let me annotate let the information rate be small r with small b as suffix and this bk is the binary information coming in this is from the source encoder now we have a channel encoder 
in the channel encoder it is going to add additional bits so the output is dk now let us say we have a block block of message bits which are containing k number of bits now output of channel encoder is totally n bit code words it is n bit code words remember this we have a block whenever we mention a block that block means source encoded bits whenever we say a code word code word means along with the message bits we will have something called check bits please see here there is something called message bits there is something called check bits when we have totally n bit code words n is definitely larger than k k is the number of message bits which we take it as a block that block can be even 4 bits it can be 8 bits it can be 16 bits it can be a nibble it can be a byte it can be a word it can be a double word it can go on like that it can be different also it need not be always in the form of bytes it can be 12 bits also it can be 24 bits also that depends on how we choose these ratios later on you will come to know how we choose them so let us say a block size is k and output of channel encoder is totally n n bits naturally it will contain k message bits n minus k check bits now this whole thing is called as a code word code word contains n bits now should this k and n minus k be separate should n minus k be coming after k or before k or can they be mixed together the answer is we choose this n minus k to be either before or after based on an algorithm they cannot be mixed at all they cannot be mixed at all that is called as block coding now now we are going to deal with the type of coding called block coding where we take a block of message bits to the block of message bits either succeeding or preceding that depends on the algorithm we will have to add additional number of bits that is n minus k bits now that is called check bits now this check bits should not be mixed with the message bits if it is mixed it is going to be a different type of algorithm as such it can be mixed also it does not matter but mixing will make it complicated okay and that sometimes that mixing is also possible that is a different type of coding right now we are focusing on a method of coding called block coding i hope this is understood that we take a block of message bits we add additional check bits and the check bits will always succeed the message bits in this particular diagram as is shown of course they can precede also but that depends on the algorithm now let us assume that it is succeeding now we have k plus n minus k totally n that means what is the bit rate out of the channel encoder now that is rb into n by k see here it was rb bits per second now because we have additional bits added it will become slightly reduced now it will become rb into n by k is it more is it less let us say rb is 1 kbps let us give an example let us say rb is 1 kbps and let us say k is 8 let us take k is 8 and let us take n is 12 now total n is 12 means we have added additional 4 bits so now r c is going to be 1 into 12 by 8 so it is going to be larger definite is going to be larger why because we added additional bits so the channel encoder's data rate will be larger than the source encoder's data rate okay that is the conclusion here now rc will always be larger than 
R B because of the addition of check bits. Now this channel encoder's output goes to the modulator, and all these binary information is going to be superimposed on a RF carrier, and the modulator is going to take that carrier out, and it is going into the noisy channel. And for the channel, we have this channel capacity as per the Shannon-Hartley law. Otherwise, also we had seen the channel capacity formula in the previous module. Later on, at the receiver, you have a demodulator, and the demodulator is only extracting all the message waveforms from the modulated signal, and the output is going to be DK cap out of the demodulator. Now, this DK cap, why? Because it contains noise as well. That's why it is given a symbol DK cap. It goes into the channel decoder at the destination, and output of the channel decoder is going to be BK cap. Now the channel decoder must have detected error, must have corrected error. Now this BK cap will go into the source decoder, and finally it can go into a DAC as well, digital to analog converter, or the digital data itself can be utilized at the destination. So this is a example of error control coding where additional check bits are added along with the message bits. Let me continue now. Due to the channel noise, the received bit stream BK cap differs from the transmitted sequence BK. It is desired that the probability of error that is P of BK cap not equal to BK be less than some predefined value. What we expect is BK cap has to be equal to BK, but that may not happen because of the channel noise. We will always have some probability of error. Hence, the channel encoder divides the input message bits into blocks of k bits and replaces each block with the n bit code word by adding n minus k check bits to each block. Let us have an example. A telephone link is having a bandwidth of 3 kilohertz. Here it is given as 3 kilohertz. Signal to noise ratio of 13 dB at a rate of 1200 bits per second. It is provided with a modem that can operate at 3600 bits per second or 3.6 kbps with error probability QC is 8 into 10 power minus 4. Please note this QC is the error probability of 8 into 10 power minus 4 which is actually quite low. It is desired to design an error control coding scheme having overall probability of error less than 10 power minus 4. Now, error probability is given 8 into 10 power minus 4. We want to have a overall probability of error that is 10 power should be less than 10 power minus 4. Let us see how to solve this. It is an example now. Now, what is given? Given is RB is 1200 bits per second, RC 3600 bits per second. Let me go back. See, RB is given, bitrate from the source encoder is given, 1200 bits per second. And RC is given, modem that can operate is given, means what? 3600 bits per second. So, this is RC. SNR is given, channel bandwidth is given, and error probability of the modem is given. So, RC is 3600 bits per second, B is 3 kilohertz. And probability of DK cap not equal to DK equals QC is 8 into 10 power minus 4. Desired probability of error is P of BK cap not equal to BK is 10 power minus 4. That means QC is given is 8 into 10 power minus 4. That is 8 times more than desired PE. We have to reduce the probability of error 8 times lesser. That means we should find out how we should add the check bits now based on the given architecture of channel encoding. So now S by N is given, we will convert it to the actual number. S by N is antilog of 13 by 10. It is given as 13 dB, right? SNR is given as 13 dB. So S by N is given antilog of 13 by 10, 19.953. So channel capacity is obtained by Shannon-Hartley law. 
that is bandwidth is 3000 into LG of 1 plus 19.953, 13,169 bits per second, 13.169 kbps is the channel capacity now. So, as RC is less than C, it is possible to transmit data by means of a suitable coding technique with a small PE. What does it mean? We have got the channel capacity as 13.169 kbps. Whereas we have this channel encoder's capacity or modem capacity 3.6 kbps. Which means 3.6 kbps is much lesser than 13.169 kbps. As per Shannon Hartley law, without increasing the signal power now, it is possible to transmit data. We need not increase the signal power now. With the existing signal to noise ratio, we can add additional check bits and we can be able to transmit the data by means of a suitable coding technique with a small probability of error. That is the outcome of Shannon Hartley law. That is why Shannon Hartley law is utilized here just to have an estimate. The proof of Shannon Hartley law is not in our curriculum. The proof is much more complicated. It's a completely mathematical proof. It is not there in our curriculum. We are using the Shannon Hartley law only to have an estimation about whether without increasing the signal power are we capable of transmitting the signal with the lesser amount of error. That is the conclusion there. So now let us find out. We have RC equals RB by N by K that is 3600 equals 1200 divided by N by K or n by k equals 3. Now for k equals 1, n equals 3. Let us say we take message bit 1 bit at a time, then we have n equals 3. That means the number of check bits n minus k must be 3 minus 1 equals 2. Which means what? Which means what? The package is much bigger than the gift now. <laughs> that is what it means. The packaging will be much bigger than the gift. For one bit of information, we should put two bits of checking as per the given data without increasing the signal power. For every one bit of information, we should add two bits as check bits. Totally it will be three bits now. So hence for a message bit zero, message bit zero, 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 zero is transmitted. And for a message bit one, 1, 1, 1 is transmitted. See, for a 0, additional 2 bits, 0, 0. For a 1, additional 2 ones, 1, 1, 1 is transmitted. Now, the noise in the channel may affect these bits during transmission. Out of these 3 zeros, any 0 may be affected. Out of 3 ones, any 1 may be affected. Let us suppose that the receiver decodes the receiver code word by using a majority logic scheme. What is meant by a majority logic scheme? I am going to show it in this tabular column now. The received bits can be right from 0, 0, 0 till 1, 1, 1. Now for 0, 0, 0, decoded message has to be obviously 0. For 1, 1, 1, the decoded message has to be obviously 1. But look at the majority logic. In If at all the received bits are 0, 0, 1, 2 are 0, 1 is 1. So applying a majority logic, two zeros are there, let it be 0. Now again here at 0, 1, 0, 2 zeros are there, so decoded message is 0. If it is 0, 1, 1, then the decoded message is 1. If it is 1, 0, 0, it is 0. 1, 0, 1 is 1. 1, 1, 0 is 1. 1, 1, 1 is 1. Here, 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1 are the only valid code words. All others are affected by noise, either by 1 bit or by 2 bits. Even 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1 also may be affected by all the 3 bits. We, we are not sure whether the 0, 0, 0 is not affected also. Let us say 1, 1, 1 itself was affected completely by noise. The destination may decode only 0, 0, 0. That is complete 100% error only. Right? We are not sure. That is why we are going for a majority logic scheme. So even 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1 also may be affected by all the 3 bits. But as we have adopted the majority logic scheme, the overall PE is given by PE equals probability of BK cap not equal to BK 
is probability of number of errors greater than equal to 2. Out of the 3 bits, if the number of errors is greater than equal to 2, then this is the probability of error. It is time now. Let me stop here because I want to discuss this in detail again in the next class. I don't want to hurry it up. So let me stop the class here now. I am going to discuss this again in the next class. See you in the next class. Take care and bye-bye.